When I was looking for my first real estate deal, my parents talked with people. The only people they knew that had done real estate deals were accidental landlords, and they were having disasters. So my parents were very concerned about my ambitions. But I was talking with people who were successful. And on this episode, we're going to talk with Mark Latour, who's done 2,000 deals in Kansas City, Missouri, so that you're looking for your first deal. You're hearing from somebody who's way beyond where you're at and has had a ton of success so that you know how this works and you know for sure that you can do this business too. You're going to really enjoy this episode with Mark De La Tour. The Deal Machine REI Podcast. Everything you need to know to get started in real estate investing. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this episode of the Deal Machine Real Estate Investing Podcast. A lot of you listening are actually working on getting your very first wholesale deal. So you're going to hear from somebody Mark De La Tour, our special guest in Kansas City, Missouri, who's not only done his first wholesale deal, but has gone on to do 2,000 deals that he found off market. So he's also got a podcast of your own we wanted to tell you about called Mistake Free Real Estate. So if you want to hear the biggest mistakes and how to avoid them in real estate investing, go check out his podcast. And now let's get started. Mark, can you tell us in about 60 seconds, tell us about you, what you're about and what you do? Sure thing, mate. Yeah, so uh, this crazy accent uh, is all the way from New Zealand. I have um, been living in America now actually uh, longer than I lived in New Zealand, but I was born and raised at the young age of 18, came over here to university um, on the back of a uh, athletic scholarship and played collegiate tennis for, for four years, got my undergrad as well as my MBA. And then when I was getting my MBA, um, flipped a house um, on off-market deal um, made about 25 grand and thought, you know, why do I want to go work at T-Mobile or Ford or Hallmark Cards, uh, which were the big employers at the time in Kansas City, um, decided to go ahead and, and uh, you know, try my luck at this whole real estate thing. And uh, it was kind of love at first flip. And now, yeah, like you say, 2000 uh, deals later, I've got a team of about 30 people here in Kansas City that we love to continue to uh, manage uh, assets for other people. We have a management company as well as a turnkey uh office here in the KC area well i'm really glad so you did this flip tennis. while you were in college right i did this flip right after college i got an education right um yeah so it was right after in 2000 this is 2001 nice okay eye opener then realized that education wasn't going to be as necessary when you flipped the house yeah, I was not a big, um, I'm not a big pro education guy. I'm not anti education. Um, but I do believe that um, you can get a lot more education now, um, kind of like off market deal, you can get off market uh, education, you know, not necessarily you yeah. don't have to go pay hundreds of 1000s of dollars to to learn what we do, especially in real estate, right? So I paid $5,000 while I was getting my MBA to go down to a course in Springfield, Missouri, a guy by the name of Larry Holder, he's not still in business, but, um, you know, provided an education, there was about 50 people in the room, and um, taught us all about real estate. And one of the things that I kind of keyed in on at the time, was off market courthouse steps, foreclosure, pre foreclosure uh, houses. And so that was kind of I did a lot of door knocking and pre foreclosure activity as kind of my niche back in the day. Amazing. Nice. Why don't you still do that niche now? You know, it's interesting. Um, Auction.com. Um, I'm sure some of your listeners would have heard of it um, as a behemoth. Um, I bought more properties on the courthouse steps from 2001 through 2017 than I think anyone else in the in the city. Um, and largely did it just with competition of maybe two or three other people. In 2014, 15, 16, we started to see a, a peak with some of the funds coming in and being uber aggressive. Um, it's kind of funny looking back now saying, oh, they were overpaying for the houses. Well, hell, I'd love to go back and get them for that price, right? But mm -hmm. um, we saw very quickly that when auction.com came in and put their stamp on the foreclosure pre-foreclosure process, it just opened up the bandwidth to so many different investors. It used to be, uh, Dave, where you would drive by a house and you would see it had tall weeds and, and some stickers on the door. And you're like, man, people would think, I wonder when that property is going to come to foreclosure. Well, I would know because I had this proprietary kind of well, not proprietary, it was public, but I had created this proprietary system of my own where we would 
um, you know, get the legal newspapers, um, scrape that into a Google Doc spreadsheet using a, v using a VA in India. I had a guy that was a runner that would go out, take pictures of the house, knock on the door, talk to people, try and engage with, with the owners. And so we were kind of first to action. Well, now auction.com is literally like you Google the address and it's like, hey, the auction's next week at 1 p.m. at the courthouse. And so it's just opened up the, the data to everybody. And so now it's a far more competitive auction where the pricing has just gone through the roof. Got it. Yeah, the pricing has gone through the roof. I went to my first auction just to see what it was about a couple of weeks ago, and there were about 60 people there. Um, so what have you done instead? You know, how have you had to adapt your business? Because obviously, you kept doing deals. Yeah, that was a challenge. So 2014, I think I did the first year away, cracked 100 deals a year. And then we were doing 100 to 200 deals a year for those next five years. In 2017, um, you know, we had to pivot and we had to realize that, man, if we stop buying foreclosures, what's that going to look like? Luckily, as you know, I'm plugged in um, with a real estate mastermind group that of gurus that are kind of well known for off market deals. And, and the other good thing about being in Kansas City is that you kind of everything happens after it happens on the coast. So I'd seen what happened in, in San Diego and Arizona and New York and Florida, where you were getting tons and tons of people on the courthouse steps. And I knew that it was not going to last forever. Making hay, for sure, in the in the sunshine, while it was relatively few people on the courthouse steps, and we could just go, um, you know, take advantage of the extreme inefficiencies in the pre-foreclosure process in Missouri. Um, but what, I knew it was not going to last forever. So we pivoted and started doing direct mail, um, and you know, some other forms of off market deal transactions, PPC, PPL, um, and, and work through those different lead gen sources to offset. And then effectively in 2019, I bought my last home on the courthouse steps and I haven't been back in four years, but we pivoted from in 2018, I think it was out. We went from doing 140 homes on the courthouse steps to 2020, where we did none. So think of that like lead gen going from like, you can get a hundred deals from this lead source and all of a sudden, boom, you've got zero and you've got, you know, 30 people in the office that you got to feed. It was a, it was a stressful time, but we, uh, the team, the team rose to the occasion. Wow. Well, you're not afraid to try something new because you moved from New Zealand to Kansas city, Missouri. <laughs> and then you, you also had totally changed your business, which was previously relying on foreclosure auctions to doing direct mail to direct to the sellers. And I'm curious, a lot of our people that are listening they're also going through some change in their life. You know, they're they're probably trying to get their first wholesale deal because they don't like their job. Maybe they lost their job. And uh, I'm just curious, like, do you ever feel stressed? Yeah, I mean, you said it was a stressful time, but you, you also seem like somebody who deals pretty well with that. Yeah, that's definitely a strength of mine. I mean, I, I honestly credit most of my success to having a blessed upbringing. My parents um, just celebrated their 50 years married. Um, they, and when, when you are born and raised in New Zealand, a very small country with only 5 million people in the South Pacific Ocean, clearly you understand that there's the rest of the world out there. I think one of the disadvantages that perhaps America gets, and I love, I'm not anti, I love this country. Um, my kids are, you know, star spangled Kiwis, you know, so um, they are they're dual <laughs> citizens, um, but very much, you know, born and raised in America, obviously. So no, I do love America. But I think one of the things that, that Americans have a disadvantage on is that they can, you know, if they want to go to sunny beaches, they think Florida and California, if they want to go to go skiing, they think Colorado and Utah, it's like if they want to, they've got, you've got so many different areas to explore America that you forget there's a whole rest of the world out there. When you're Definitely. born in, in a country that is so small, you know, there's the rest of the world. So my parents, you know, grew us wings and encouraged us to fly and go chase our dreams. And I think that's something that I've always had in the back is knowing that, look, my parents had my back like, they, hey, go try that, go try that, go try that. Um, I was at a private boarding school at age 12. So I mean, you know, I they valued education at a very high level. And um, so they, uh, you know, encouraged me to go and um, just chase my my dreams. So from age 12, I wasn't living at home. And then when I graduated age 18, um, uh, well, actually 17 from from high school, I waited and, and from December through to August, and then came over to America to kind of pursue you know, this whole tennis thing, but I never, I accepted a scholarship to the Kansas city, the university of Missouri here in Kansas city without having ever gone to Kansas city. So maybe I'm a little bit crazy. Um, but America just seemed like a cool place to come, uh, you know, hang out. And, um, yeah, my parents supported that. That's amazing. You had such supportive parents. Blessed, right? I mean, not many, you know, I, I see other people. Um, in fact, that's a lot of times I get, you know, when, when, 
people meet my family or come down to New Zealand or, you know, we talk they you know, they just say that's a massive strong suit because not only my parents, but also my siblings, like I'm the least talented of all my siblings. I mean, my brother is a, you know, a very famous actor in New Zealand. He's been on the number one show in New Zealand for, for six straight years. He's my sister's a world-class triathlete, right? Went to the world triathlon championships. My brother's running this, uh, he's the country manager for this huge rental car company. And I'm just this, you know, guy trying to flip a few houses. So, uh, well, I've seen you, you play pickleball. So you're also talented in that. Realm. <laughs> That's Very kind talented. of unfair though. Yeah. Like using your tennis against a bunch of amateur pickleballers. Yeah, it was funny. You know, the first time I played was with, with Medley, Jason Medley, the founder of, of uh, collective genius who was deeply passionate about uh, pickleball and I'd never played. And so he took me out on the court and, um, He's just like, that's not fair that you beat me when, when you've never played, before. you know, I'm like, it's pretty darn similar. I'm pretty good at ping pong and, and it's hand-eye coordination. Right. So when you switch hey, over can to, can we, yeah, go ahead, go ahead David. No, I, I, I'm curious, like this mistake free real estate stuff is right in your face uh, <laughs> yeah. in your background here. So I kind of want to ask, um, uh, for some of the, of our listeners who are in you know, the first phases, I guess, of the real estate world. Can you point out a couple mistakes for for somebody that may be coming into the real estate world that's new to the real estate world? Um, what are some of the entry level mistakes that you see? Yeah, so first to explain, that's a, a book I wrote called, uh, it was my first uh, time at authoring a book. And uh, I, I nicknamed it, well, I named it uh, Mistake for Real Estate, because, you know, very much tongue in cheek, right? There's Clearly, um, you, there's so many mistakes to mis to make in flipping houses. The idea is that you know my clients avoid those same mistakes because they partner with me as a turnkey provider. I've made all the mistakes in real estate so that others don't have to. Is kind of the idea behind mm -hmm. that. But oh my goodness, um, the common mistakes for a rookie, I think, are to not do it at all. It's paralysis by analysis. And so I think the biggest mistake that people make is they don't invest in real estate. They, they are so safe that they just start putting into the stock market, which they don't realize is legalized gambling, right? I mean, it's even worse. You, you can control real estate to a certain degree. Um, and then the other thing is, I think, uh, competing over collaboration. I'm a big collaborate guy. So, you know, if I had someone right now that was in Kansas City that said, hey, Mark, I'm a rookie. Like, I know nothing about what I'm doing, but I think this is a deal. Can I just JV this with you? Absolutely, right? Like, coach them up on it. So, why not go to an expert who knows how to rehab? Because I think the mistake people make in real, it's such a big thing. You've got to go, you know, acquisitions um, is a major, there are people that all they do is acquire, right? Because it's kind of wholesaling business. It's all they do is just acquisitions. They're experts at acquisitions. And then there's remodeling companies that remodel houses for a living. That's a whole nother business. So you got to get really, mm -hmm. really good at remodeling. Yep. And there's so many mistakes there. And then they think, oh, I'm going to hold real estate. Oh, now you're going to become an expert property manager. Well, you know what? There's people that do that just mm. for a living. And then there's people that right. buy and sell real estate as real estate agents. Like there's so many things that people try and be all things like just niche down. The more niche right. you can be, if you want to be a, a bird dog, go find deals and find someone that you can partner with. That's either a rehabber or a property manager or someone that can, that can solve the other you know, you've got to buy it, rehab it, get it rented out and sell it, right? Or buy it, rehab and flip <laughs> it. Like figure out collaboration over competition. It's not about making money. It's about education. And people will so willingly go pay $200,000 to go to Vanderbilt to get this amazing education in liberal arts. Dude, mm -hmm. you're not willing to partner with someone and give up $10,000 in deal to learn how to flip a house? Like it's a what little do you, bit. Why do you think that barrier is there? Why does, why, I mean- I felt that coming in the very first time we did a wholesale deal and I heard, oh, so-and-so is wanting to wholesale in St. Joe like you. And I was like, uh-uh, no way. Now I don't even think about it because we have, we've gotten a niche and it's, I mean, I don't need to worry about it, but why is that such a thing? Why do people worry so much about the idea of partnering with somebody that may have a buyer for the deal you just found? So I think it comes back to the education system um, that there is a scarcity mindset. You have to go to school to learn. You know, the reason that we have nine to five um, hours of operation in a school is because they're training you to be an employee and go work nine mm -hmm. to five, right? And mm -hmm. the other thing is they they don't, 
They don't foster, um, they're not talking about open AI and, you know, the people are outlawing, you know, chat GPT for kids because they don't want to plagiarize, you know, well, what are you going to do? I mean, Dave, have you written content using chat GPT? Yes, I actually take our podcast transcripts and yep. then I write the episode description by pasting the entire transcript in and having chat GPT give me its best shot at describing it. Now, it's not perfect every time. But I'll just say like, hey, can you do this again, but focus on this person's first deal where they made $30,000 instead of something else he talked about. And I, I just get the, the descriptions that way. Yeah. So you're an outlier and that you're using it in your business. Most people would say, oh, you cannot mm -hmm. do that. It's, it's rules, rules. Don't do that. Don't, they don't encourage free thinking. Like an Elon Musk is an outside of the box thinker. And he would, he would have been a terrible student because he would have said, oh, you have ADD. You can't do this. You can't do that. Because... Mm -hmm. These brains, they don't, you're, we're not fostering creativity and collaboration and thinking partnerships from the get go. We're thinking, don't share your, uh, you know, don't share your goals and your dreams and your mindset and what you're doing. You've got to keep it all to yourself. And, and it, it's a scarcity mindset. Um, I think one of the biggest changes in my life was joining a mastermind group where people start talking about their wins because I came in thinking, mm -hmm. It's me versus the world, right? I mean, same thing. I'm competitive. You know, I'm a, I'm a tennis player, I'm a golfer, it was an individual sport you know, it's me versus the world. And you kind of think that sometimes. Um, so for me to come in and, and be able to open my mind to say, wow, these guys are really sharing their playbook with me. Why is that? And mm -hmm. the, you know, the abundant mindset was something that took a while for me to wrap my head around. And now I'm a, I'm a believer. For sure. Do you use that. it? Do I use chat GPT? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so my team is writing, um, I, we, we use it for SEO, um, I used it um, to write uh, a few questions for the uh, wonderful, uh, you know, podcast episode that you came on recently, David, um, which by the way, when I said I'm interviewing David, the CEO of Deal Machine, it knew all about you. It knew exactly who you were and what you did. So kudos that it didn't Ooh. have to say, wait, who's Dave, you know, <laughs> but yeah, I use it for um, writing better questions for writing letters and scripting things out. And, and my marketing team specifically uses it a lot for, um, you know, follow up and uh, write its crafting scripts and um, content that you can just step slap up there for SEO. I think SEO is a little bit of voodoo science. If you're not really creating content for the right. internet to find, yeah, you're not, yeah, exactly. it's not worth doing it. So we create a lot of SEO content with ChatGPT. Please open up your podcast app right now and leave us a review and let us know what you thought of this episode. It means so much because the reviews help us get in front of more people. And the more people we can get in front of, the more we can help them achieve financial freedom. And we also get more energy to put more content out like this to help you. So by leaving us a review, it will give you more content to come to help you along in your journey. Thank you so much. So w whenever you actually switch from bringing it back to real estate investing and, and finding those off market properties, I I'm curious, whenever you switch from foreclosures to the direct mail, how did those deals compare in terms of, you know, how deeply could you buy the property at a discount? Yeah, it, it it is very different. I, the thing I loved about pre foreclosure is they're on a dead uh, a timeline because we took it from um, not just notice of default, we took it from notice of sale. So they had 21 days in the state of Missouri to figure out their problem, which I love, right? I'll like give me a deadline and I'll I'll crush it. So, you know, I got told to get the f off my lawn by a lot of people, you know. But then I would go to the courthouse steps just in case they didn't have it figured out with the bank, um, and then I would buy the house at auction. For less than I was offering them and turn around and say, now you can get the F off my lawn, right? Or get <laughs> I mean, it's just this this game you play with people where they think they have it figured out. And then um you're just trying to solve a problem in a very, very quick time frame. So the, that was the bad stories. The good stories were the ones where you could go and and some you know guy owed, you know, forty thousand dollars on a two hundred thousand dollar house, um, but he had a gambling problem and he was gonna lose, he just needed that income now. So we would buy it for 40k, let him stay there, do a rent back to owner. And he could live there for as long as he wanted and and we wouldn't kick them out of the house um you know we were the ones that were using that as as a um an option to give allowing people to stay in their homes rather than what the banks would do is just hey you you got foreclosed on get them out stick it on the market and try and uh, get it sold on the back end we were willing to give people an extra option so that was the the time frame of dealing with people on the courthouse steps was very immediate the thing that we had to pivot to when we were going direct to seller is the timelines are extended, like they don't have to make an immediate decision. So 
you know, I was very bad at follow up. I'm just not, you know, it's not, I'm a, you know, clearly a, a visionary CEO. So the team was challenged with the responsibility of coming up with really good follow up sequencing. I think um, many, many, many rookies make the mistake of discounting um, that just because they get a no now, it doesn't mean no forever. And the follow up, um, a lot of our deals happen three months after the initial contact. So making sure that you continue to educate and stay in touch with and, you know, knocking on a door and getting a no is just like, okay, well, that's not right now. And then yeah. we would just continue mm -hmm. to follow up. It's, it's so funny when you said uh, you approached somebody that you saw was going into foreclosure and they were like, get off my lawn. And then you ended up buying it at the auction. And then, of course, you had to tell them you own the house now. <laughs> like, yeah, they've got to get right, off the lawn. It would have oh, been so it, it would have been helpful for you to have done the deal first, right? Like a lot of people don't even know that how the foreclosure process works when they're in it. And so as like a new person, I remember feeling weird, like, oh, I'm bothering this person. But really, if you can speak to them and educate them on what's about to happen, you know, with their situation, you could save their their credit from actually having that derogatory mark, right? If you prevent it from going to foreclosure and you buy it directly from them. Yeah, 100%. A lot of benefits to going in there and getting done. The biggest one, obviously, as an investor is that you're not going to have the competition of getting it, you know, bid up on the courthouse steps. But yeah, clearly to them, it was, um, you know, stopping the foreclosure, damaging their credit. What I realized, and I started doing flyers and marketing pieces to try and appeal to these people, they don't care about their credit. At this point, they're just like, mm. if I have a 500 credit score, and it's going to get an atom bomb dropped on, and it's going to go to 300, I don't care. Um, but I want I want the I want to know where I'm going to live tomorrow. So that is the pressure point that people feel is they don't know that they think if they get foreclosed on, it's the sheriff showing up the next day and they don't know it might be, you know, 30 or 60 days later, but that, that looming over their head is a huge motivating factor for them to make a quick decision. And so, you know, again, like anything, I mean, I think the, the thing I would tell your, your listeners is a, don't just go buy in the courthouse steps There's many, many, many title issues and make sure you have a good process around finding if you're buying clear title or not. Um, I've, one of the big mistakes people made early, Ryan, you've probably seen this, is when someone goes in and they do research on title and they think they're buying a house for forty thousand dollars. It's worth two hundred, and they're like, "Oh, oops, I bought a second mortgage, you know, and now I own yeah, the rights exactly. to pay off the first mortgage." So, yeah, there's, there's that's essentially not... what scared me away from doing it, like because yeah. we we had had that we had a couple investors that were like, "Hey, you should get come check out what we're doing buying tax sale properties," and I like looked at two of them and I had the title company pull records up. And I'm like, I'm not messing with any of this. I'll go back to driving for dollars and sending postcards. Yeah, so a lot of um, things to avoid. But um, yeah, I think the mistake people make early is just not um, educating. You know, come of it, come at it not just um, if you drive service and value to your customers, you're going to get paid. So don't look at it as I'm going to flip this house and you know make a bunch of money. It's like someone's in distress, someone's in trouble. When you start putting yourself in their shoes and trying to solve for their problem, which is not necessarily maximizing the return on sale, clearly, yeah. if they were trying to do that, they would have cleaned the house up, listed it for sale with a realtor and sold it a year ago when they saw themselves going to the trouble. But now their main uh, source of concern is, where am I going to sleep in 30 days time? And then that ticking mm -hmm. time bomb that there's, there's giving causing them grief. So solving for it's solving very clearly for the problem at hand. And educating them on what that process looks like and giving them value um, is how you can, you know, obviously uh, help help out people. And, and I've found that the more people I help, you know, the the greater that um, we're able to increase the bank account on the back end. And that's always can a good I thing. Ask, can I ask one more thing? It was something that you had mentioned in the in the podcast pre-show warm-up, uh, talking about uh, these new investors that are wholesaling and maybe a strategy on how to, okay, you get your first deal done, you're going on and you're doing your second and your third. What's another piece of advice on sure. maybe do a couple, <clears throat> keep one? No, I appreciate the teeing it up, Ryan. I mean, my biggest, if someone says, what's the biggest mistake people make in real estate, um, paralysis by analysis and not doing a deal is by far and away the biggest mistake people make. I literally have people that are saying, oh, you're so lucky, or you're, you know, I can't believe you, you know, you've got all this stuff, or you've got all this, this portfolio of real estate. And I'm like, mate, I remember talking to you specifically 15 years ago, when I was buying real estate, and saying you should buy real estate, and you didn't do it. 15? You've been putting your money. Mm -hmm. Oh, mate, it's, it's so it, long. <laughs> I've been doing it for 22 years, right? So the same people that I was, 
because I was just like, this is a kid in a candy store, Ryan. I'm like, oh my God, I just bought this house for 20 grand and I'm not planning on selling it, but I know it's worth 150 today. So it's that, you yeah. know, they say delayed gratification is a sign of maturity. And I think my, I, I think I have a lot of, I was a mature investor at a young age. I knew that even though I bought it for 20K, allowing that person to immediately rent it for 900 bucks a month and me doing nothing to it in like a rent back to owner situation would would pay off dividends in the long run. And so the more I did of that, the more I, you know, was seen like the good guy, like you're allowing people to stay in their homes and, and that was fine. And occasionally, you know, they would not pay and then we'd just go in and rehab it and, and then stick someone else in there. But the point being, too many people never get started buying real estate because they're so content with just abdicating their wealth accumulation to the stock market or financial advisor, thinking truly that the financial advisor has their best interests at heart. No, the Wolf of Wall no. Street is is like such a, a like you know that 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 um, awesome scene with Leo and Matthew McConaughey when he's given it the mm -hmm, you know right. up in the in the like when he says your job is to take as much money from your client and stick it in your own pocket like right. that literally is their role I mean, that's what they're trying to do right they they it's a fees exactly. based company and and yet too much uh, time people just say well I'm just going to put it in and, and I'm I'm assuming they're telling me that I'll have enough you know, money at the end of the day to hopefully live on. Well, I'm not going to take that chance. I believe that true financial wealth is where passive income from assets that you own is spitting off enough money that you will never have to work again. Right. It's not that mm -hmm. I have to sell stuff. Because remember, they accumulate this massive net worth that then they will have to sell down to live off of. I don't want to sell assets, mm -hmm. you know, to live off the money. I just want to have assets that are spitting off cash flow. And there's very few that I've found that do it as well as real estate does. So the biggest mistake people make is, you know, back to your original question, Ryan, is if you're flipping two uh, houses or if you're wholesaling two houses, keep the next one. Be the patient investor. You will thank me. It's so easy to look back in the review mirror, back to this concept, saying, oh, Mark, you, you own hundreds of houses, lucky you. I'm like, well, I did defer gain. I could have made more money back in the day, but I'm a patient investor that holds on. The one truth that I will stand by and stick my flag in the ground on is I've never met a 70 year old investor, man or woman that says, Mark, I wish I didn't own those 200 doors that I bought 20 years ago. Just you, you'll never meet that person. Right. In fact, we I only think here in masterminds are like, man, I wish I would have kept more properties from wholesalers. Yeah. And with the financial you know, advisor thing too, it's like they, your financial advisor can lose all your money and he doesn't lose any money himself. Like that was my biggest issue when I was in my 20s. I knew I wanted to retire early. I didn't know about real estate investing, but I was very interested in stocks and I was learning a ton and I was getting hitting up by people who were becoming financial advisors who were what, 20, 22. And yeah. then nobody had a payment structure that would say they only make money when I make money and that they would lose money if I lost money. <clears throat> and that was my problem. It's like, yeah, I can lose my money for free. I'd rather mm -hmm. do that than pay you to lose my money. So let me go figure this mm -hmm. out. Let me figure out investing on my own. And that's such a good point. And, and why I ultimately found real estate, because it was like, well, the stock market can go up or down. And real estate prices can value. But look, I mean, the past 70 years, they've doubled every, you know, what is it, 15 years? And if you buy it when they cash flow, it doesn't even matter what the value of the property does because you're making money every month. Yeah, look, Mark, I, mean, I did this. Uh, I may have gone a little overboard on this concept. And I want you to analyze this and kind of give me feedback on this this is the moment i air out dirty laundry to all <laughs> of our podcast listeners so we had such a successful 2020 and 2021 megan and i were like let's buy a bunch of stuff like we've got an influx of cash let's become let's let's buy some stuff well that led to we had at one point, I think we had 10 properties that were just sitting. They were vacant. They were not doing anything. We didn't, we were working on maybe one at a time. I've slowly chipped that down to, I think we have three, but I kind of feel like that was maybe a mistake. But now I'm kind of wondering, I'm like, I don't know if that's necessarily a mistake because I didn't lose, I wasn't really losing anything by buying these assets. They, they didn't, they weren't like money lost. I'm never getting that back. No, um, you pay tax when you sell assets, right? So if you never sell, you don't right. pay tax. And a lot of poor mistakes in real estate um, can be solved by holding on long term. I mean, there's 
many times when I have regretted selling an asset, there are very few times when I have regretted buying an asset. Fine. And, um, you know, the, the tax code is literally written. I mean, you, you mentioned making some good money in 2021. Um, you know, the real estate professionals, which if you're wholesaling or listening to this podcast, you know, or you want to get your license, um, it is one of the greatest advantages over everyone else is the amount of write-offs that you get as a real estate investor. Um, you can take 100% of your, your paper losses versus only maxing out at 25K if you're a non uh, real estate professional. So um, yeah, all of the tax code is written. So, and then the longer you hold the tax code is written even more, you know, everyone will say, well, how, how can you depreciate an asset? Um, you let's say you buy an asset for 150,000 as a rental, and you depreciate it down to zero. Does that mean you just stop depreciating it? Maybe, maybe not, right? Because if you pass that uh, on to an heir, they can depreciate that as well. So my family mm -hmm. will depreciate these same assets that I'm depreciating, my, the next generation will depreciate those assets. Then the next generation will depreciate those assets. And by the way, they'll all have the real estate mm -hmm. license so they can continue to take maximum depreciation and just use the tax code to their advantage. So, um, you know, buying and holding by far and away is the greatest wealth accumulation method um, that I know of. Um, you know, and look, I'm not saying that you can't make money in, in, in other environments, but for those of you that have passion in real estate, just hold on to real estate. Yes, you have to have an active income. So I'm not you know, you have to stabilize and have an active income first. Any ancillary money that you are making, don't go buy the flashy car. Don't go try and keep up with the Joneses. If you delay gratification by buying real estate now, you will then be the wisest, richest guy that people know come 10 years from now. For it sure. might take a little while to feel that way, but it will. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you know, live in a big home and, and um, it's paid for and, and I didn't do that through active income. Um, right. but you know, I, I, when I was looking at interest rates, just historically being so low and I knew they eventually go up, I did a, you know, I took my 70 single family homes and just did one big corporate refi onto one note. Cause really I wouldn't even take credit that I was thinking too far ahead other than I was just irritated by, you know, I'd just been in the game so long that every, every year, you know, I'd have another, Oh, this one's maturing. This one's maturing. I'm like, can I just put these on one note? So I went to a bank and got one commercial loan. And when we analyzed the portfolio, he's like, how much do you want to pull out? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, they appraised at 8.7. And I'm like, well, I think I only owe 2.7, right? And he's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, how much do you want to pull out? So I pulled out a couple million and just, you know, paid off the home, stuck a bunch in the bank, you know, and suddenly mm -hmm. it's like, that's just tax-free money. How long would it have taken me to pay off my home just through active income? It's just would have taken forever. But those are the powers that, that come from, you know, assets that go up in value, banks willing to lend on it. If I would have gone to them mm -hmm. and said, hey, I have some stock in Google, can you you know, give me an 80% loan to value? They would think I'm crazy. But with real estate, it's obviously always that case. That's amazing. That's yeah. been a recurring theme on the podcast is that if you have an asset that's appreciated, you can actually just refinance that and then take that money out and it's tax-free. If you were to sell it or if it was a flip, you would pay a lot of tax on that property. So even, yeah, taking that money out is something that I think uh, Ryan and I both considered and, and now we're hearing it again. So it's just now we got to go do it. Dude, it's great. Let's yeah. say you put them on a 20, this is silly, but you put them on a 20 year note in 20 years. So you, you'll be sooner, but let's say that you, in, in uh, 15 years, you've got them paid down to like 40% and they've appreciated and almost doubled in value again. So you pull out another couple of mil. And then you pay them to have your tenants. I say pay it down. The tenants are paying it down, right? And then you, you they double in value again. You you pull some more money out. I mean, it's just a constant thing. And then, oh, by the way, when you die, your heirs get these tax free. Then they turn around and start depreciating or pulling cash out or taking the cash flow from these assets. I mean, it's this never ending game. There's a reason why the richest people in America are landowners. You know, the Vanderbilts, mm -hmm. Rockefellers, the Trumps. I mean, it's just generational wealth. And that's what, again, I'm not saying everyone has to, you know, you know, give gift everything to their kids, but I mean, do whatever you want with the with them. You can gift them to a charity. But there's the generational wealth game is played with real estate. For sure. Well, we're coming up on our time, Mark. I wondered if you actually have uh any connections between your tennis playing, your sports, and actually being a really successful business person. What do you think's transferred over there? Oh, I think the discipline to become a very, you know, high level athlete um, absolutely translates. Um, I think any anyone who's interviewing with me, if they have had, um, you know, an athletic background um, is 
is always an appealing hire. I think, in fact, Enterprise Rent a Car is a company that goes and gets the the D1 athletes that have come in and mm-hmm. been university. They graduate with a D1 athlete because when you're at school and you're juggling a job, um, you're you know training your games as well as your studies. Um, you know, it's a pre- that translates pretty well to coming into a work environment and, and doing it as well. Um, again, I was an individual sport athlete in tennis and golf. And so I've always had that inner drive. Um, so I think that translates pretty well. Um, you know, I just put it all on my shoulders and just go try and crush. And then it's the competition. I mean, life's competition, right? It's like, mm. and, you know, sometimes, and I, I'm not, I, I know we've talked a lot about money today. I'm not a big money guy. It is what it is. Um, there's a million more people that have way more money and some that have less, but it doesn't matter. But you know, it's a th- that can be a scorecard for those in their twenties. Like money is a scorecard. You know, how well are you doing? Your bottom line on your P and L will tell you how well you're doing. It's it's just a fact of life. There's KPIs and metrics, but at the end of the day, if that bottom right hand corner is, is a negative number, you're not going to be in business very long. So, you know, being competitive, comparing to others, understanding what others are doing, and trying to keep up and compete is a hell of a way to to go. So I just have a uber competitive streak. Um, and I just, just love winning and I love surrounding myself with those that, that have that same desire. Right. Yeah. Love it. Well, it's definitely inspiring to me. And I know those who are looking for their first wholesale deal, you guys go check out Mark's podcast, mistake free real estate. And we really appreciate you being on today, Mark, taking time away from your business. We know you're out there trying to find real estate deals as well and providing those turnkey properties for somebody who maybe doesn't want to become a wholesaler, or maybe they tried and they actually would rather just funnel money from their job into an asset that they can pick up from you. And so uh, go check out Mistake Free Real Estate. And thanks again, Mark. You bet, Dave. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for listening to the Deal Machine Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please leave us a review and follow along wherever you're listening to your podcast.